In 1983, William Peter Blatty blessed fans of The Exorcist with Legion, a novel following Detective William Kinderman 12 years after the events of The Exorcist as he investigates a string of murders that resemble those committed by a killer long thought to be dead. Blatty wrote and directed the adaptation for the novel himself, which released in 1990, and it has since been hailed as one of the best horror sequels ever made. Good evening. My name's Evan and welcome to Rockland Graves. The whole time I was working on my Exorcist 2 review, all I could think about was how badly I just wanted to skip it and go straight to Legion. Unlike Heretic, this movie allows both dopamine and serotonin to circulate freely and my vital organs continue to function as expected while I watch it. Heretic was a mess, and it would be another 13 years before The Exorcist would get a sequel that could completely wipe that movie from the minds of people unfortunate enough to watch it. William Friedkin wasn't involved this time around, giving William Peter Blatty full control over this adaptation, at least to a degree. As with the original movie, there are two cuts of The Exorcist 3. Blatty seems to have some bad luck with getting his cut of a movie released. I had a lot less trouble deciding which cut I'd be covering for the review with this one, because the director's cut it's just titled Legion, uses far lower quality dailies for the added scenes because the original negatives couldn't be found, and it's not nearly as widespread. It is closer to the novel in some ways, but because of the jarring transition between the original negatives and the dailies, it's more something to watch if you're interested from a filmmaking perspective. So as with the first one, I'll be talking about the theatrical version for the sake of the review, but there is a chance I'll do a cut comparison down the line if there's enough interest in that kind of thing. This story does concern some of the same characters from the original, but it's anything but a retread of it. The Exorcist 3 is a golden example of how to do a sequel properly, so let's take a look at it. There you go, blaming God. Who should I blame? Phil Rizzuto? You wouldn't want to live forever. Yes, I would. No, you wouldn't. You'd get bored. I have hobbies. I'll start things off by mentioning that while Bill Kinderman and Joseph Dyer are here, Lee J. Cobb and William O'Malley did not reprise their roles. Kinderman is now played by George C. Scott and Dyer is played by Ed Flanders, which does admittedly make it pretty jarring as a double feature when this is a direct sequel to the first movie. Recasting can go downhill pretty quickly, but thankfully here it's about as smooth as it can be. Lee J. Cobb's performance is one of my favorite things about the first movie, but George C. Scott embodies the character extremely well and gives an absolutely fantastic performance. I tell Ryan that we have nothing to go on in this case. You know what he says to me? Win some, lose some. You're a racist, Ryan. Did you know that? Ed Flanders is equally good in the role as Father Dyer, so while it's a little disappointing that we couldn't get more of Lee J. Cobb and William O'Malley, the roles are in great hands. What did you say to him? Jesus loves you, everyone else thinks you're an asshole. The story picks up 15 years after Reagan's exorcism, and Kinderman's friendship with Father Karras has stuck with him ever since. He and Father Dyer are both reminiscing on the friend they lost, as Dyer takes a moment to look down the staircase that Damien fell down during the exorcism. One of the distinct qualities of that first movie is the candid feel that William Friedkin brought to the production with his history and documentary filmmaking, but with him not being involved this time around, this film has a different presentation that doesn't feel quite as immersive, at least not in the same way. The Exorcist can sometimes feel like watching a documentary, but The Exorcist 3 feels a lot more like a traditional movie in the way scenes are paced, how the shots are framed, and in the more amplified nature of certain moments. That's not a bad thing because it's still very well directed, but it's just a different way of presenting the story to the audience. I bring it up now because right off the bat we see a quiet church in the middle of the night get its doors blown open by some unknown presence throwing roses inside and causing Bible pages to blow all over the place, which apparently kickstarts the resurrection of Pinocchio Christ. That's just not something you would see in the original movie. That always maintained a strong sense of realism, even with the more paranormal scenes. Again, it's not a bad thing, but it's important to set the right expectations so that you're not constantly comparing it to the first movie. I think that's something really important with The Exorcist 3, and it's one of the reasons it's considered one of the best horror sequels. It can stand totally on its own, and it doesn't concern itself with trying to do what the original did. We're in a dream sequence here, and it's a POV of someone walking down a street towards the staircase in the middle of the night. And As he approaches the stairs, a young boy hands the unknown person a rose. Blatty always uses metaphors in his storytelling, and this one scene sets up a major element of the story while also establishing the roses as a piece of symbolism that's important throughout. I have dreams of a rose. 
The unknown person falls down the stairs, and we then pick up the following day with a scene of Father Dyer giving mass spliced together with a homicide that occurred the night prior that Kinderman's investigating. A young boy named Thomas Kintry was brutally murdered and defiled. I won't get into all the gruesome details of his murder, but to sum it up, Whoever did this is fucked up, racist, and blasphemous. William Peter Blatty is extremely good at writing witty dialogue, and that was something that you could see some of in the original movie, particularly with the scenes between Karis and Kinderman. You know who I think really did it? Who? The Dominicans go pick on them. I could have you deported, you know that? The Exorcist 3 ramps that up quite a bit, and while it's not quite as prevalent as it is in the novel, there are countless examples of how good Blatty is at this kind of thing. If I were to go through and show you all the individual lines that I love in this movie, we'd be here for way too long, but suffice it to say, Kinderman being brought to the forefront of this story makes for some of the most entertaining dialogue out there. Bill, it all works out right. When? At the end of time. That soon. It also shows that while, yes, Lee J. Cobb was absolutely fantastic, a lot of the quality of his character was because of Blatty's fantastic writing, and George C. Scott is also completely capable of bringing out some of the same qualities with his performance. Well-written sarcasm is hard to do, and it can often come off as obnoxious, but the way that Blatty handles it is a sterling example of how it should be done. The scenes between Kenderman and Dyer are the best showcase of this sort of thing, with their effortless back and forth banter making their friendship feel really believable and it, it's just so entertaining and tuesday night she's cooking as a carp it's a tasty fish i i have nothing against it and for three days it's been swimming up and down in my bathtub that relationship is really important to this story and it's established really well early on by just watching them interact today is the anniversary of karis's death and every year on that day the two spend time together to try and ease the loss i love how they both explain the way they see this unfortunate but sweet tradition to others yeah every uh, every year on this day he gets depressed so i i try to cheer him up so you're home now no gotta go again Today's my day to cheer up our friend Father Dyer. Each of them says they have to go to cheer the other one up, seemingly trying to hide how badly they both rely on seeing one another on this day. It's a common thing for men to put on that facade of like, oh, I've got everything under control and I don't need anyone to feel all right. And then that little detail of them describing this, like they're doing it as a favor to the other one, goes a long way to making their friendship feel genuine. Less than 15 minutes into this movie, and it already has more engaging dialogue than some other movies have in their entire runtime. A priest is killed in a really chilling scene where during a confession, an unseen woman starts talking about extremely brutal murders in a very matter-of-fact way, and the priest is found by a woman who also had a few things to get off her chest. Kinderman once again is investigating this murder, and this is the second time now we've seen him check something about the victim. The first time it seemed like he was naturally horrified by what he found, but now it seems more like he's recognizing something that's setting him off. The next day, Bill finds out that Joseph has been hospitalized, and once again, the back and forth between these two is so natural and relatable. I brought you a hamburger, Father. I'm not hungry. You need eat half. It's from Clyde. Where'd the other half come from? Space, your native country. One of the details of Thomas Kintry's death was that his head was replaced by that of a statue of Jesus Christ. And as Bill is leaving the hospital, he walks past the decapitated statue of the big man without noticing it. New details regarding the two murders are becoming more clear, like Thomas Kintry having been drugged so precisely that whoever was responsible must have had medical experience. And Kinderman's ahead of the forensic analyst who finds prints on the sliding door in the confessional booth. Nobody touches this pulpit, with the priest and the killer. The Exorcist 3 is a little more cerebral than its predecessor, and later that night, Kinderman has a dream that I'm really only bringing up because Sam Jackson is in it? Please. The living are dead. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, Bill talks to Thomas. There's a little more detail about what this place actually is in the novel, but it's left mostly up to interpretation here. I think it's a good example of how different things fit into certain mediums better than others, or at least how they can be applied and mean something else depending on the medium. Basically, this is sort of a limbo where people who died wait to be sent off to wherever it is they go, but... I can't help but only think about the meaning of life every time I see it. And I'd like to sing a song for all of you. We see the priest who was murdered and Thomas, both with their heads seemingly stitched back on, which seems kind of mean of whoever's in charge here, because if they can reattach human heads, 
They can make it a little more seamless. What's concerning though is that right before waking up to a phone call, Bill finds Joseph also looking like his head had to be put back on. Bill wakes up and answers the phone and he rushes to the hospital where he finds that tragically Joseph was murdered overnight. This movie really wants to pull at the heartstrings, eh? Setting up their friendship to be this honest and beautiful, you lean on me, I lean on you situation, and then ripping that apart. It's heartbreaking because in the years since Reagan's exorcism and the death of Damien, the two bonded over their shared love of the man and each helped ease the other's loss by carrying that load together. And now Bill's been robbed of that support system that his best friend was. Scott's performance here tells you everything you need to know about how he's feeling even when he's not speaking. Once again, Bill checks something under the blanket and while we don't know yet what that is, it's made pretty clear that he was also decapitated like the previous victims. Not only did Joseph suffer that mutilation, but his entire blood supply was drained into vials, with the only drop outside of the vials being found on the wall. Alright, I know I've been dancing around what's under the blankets a lot, so let's talk about what's been going on with that. There's a bit of bouncing around the hospital for leads from a woman in the psychiatric ward who was spotted in the halls around the time that Joseph would have been killed, to Kinderman briefly visiting the disturbed ward. We'll get back to that in a second. I was only 21 when I died. Before Kenderman gets a chance to speak with that man, Atkins calls him to a meeting with one of the higher-ups at the hospital who's incredibly frustrated with the police interference in the hospital. This is where we learn about the Gemini Killer, an infamous serial killer who died 15 years ago. The police gave an inaccurate MO to the press so that they could weed out crazy people who came in claiming to be the killer, but these recent murders have all had the true MO of the Gemini, which is what's been driving Kinderman so crazy. If the true MO was never made public, the fact that these murders match it could mean that the Gemini isn't dead, and there's one more clue that seems to make this impossibility seem possible. And he always doubled his final L's, whatever the word, two L's, as in wonderful. It's also around this time that Kinderman narrows down the murder weapon when a pair of shears in the hospital are found with the new tag on them, indicating that they were recently replaced after the last pair went missing. Things are starting to fall into place now, and Bill visits the church to speak with a priest who may be able to help him piece together the clear religious connection that these murders have. Two priests killed and a boy crucified. The priest points out to Bill that each of the murders has been connected to Reagan's exorcism in some fashion. Father Dyer was close with Karis. The priest who was killed in the confessional booth was the one who permitted Karis to investigate the potential possession, and Thomas's mother was the one who figured out that the voice on the tape that Karis had analyzed was Reagan speaking English in reverse. They were all connected in some way to that case. Fingerprint analysis on the vials of Dyer's blood comes back and shows a positive match for the woman in psychiatric, but just like last time, they can't get anything from her that's of any use. That radio isn't mine. Mine is newer. She's one bong rip away from Catatonia, so they move on for now. Kinderman's about to get some pretty substantial information from Dr. Temple pertaining to the case, but what's odd is that before he enters, Temple is using the same method I used to use for making these videos before I invested in a teleprompter. Police brought him in here 15 years ago. It's annoying as shit, dude. Make sure you have Advil on standby. That works too. Temple fills Bill in on all the information about that patient he was about to see earlier on in the day, revealing that he was brought in 15 years ago and was completely amnesic. It wasn't until six weeks ago that it began to seem a little more there, and after that he quickly turned violent, so they've kept him in isolation and have been giving him electroshock therapy. There's one other thing. He says he's the Gemini killer. This whole sequence is fantastic. We see that Bill went to visit the patient, but we don't see the man himself. Immediately, you can tell that something's wrong, and questions start firing off like crazy when Kinderman leaves the room and gets Atkins to pull the file on Damien Karras. That's such a perfect way to throw off the audience, and the punchline of this scene is one of my favorite holy shit moments in horror. The man in cell 11. Is Damien Karras. Once Kinderman returns to the cell, we get to see exactly what set the man off with our own eyes. Damien Karras is certainly the man here. At least that's what it seems to be. Who are you? I am no one. The way he speaks and the things he's saying are nothing like the priests we knew before. He claims that he's the Gemini killer, and while it's clear to the eye that this is Damien Karras, the details that he shares about the Gemini killings are too accurate for someone outside of law enforcement to know about. Remember, Karen? Little ribbons in her hair. Yellow ribbons. 
Once the detective says that the Gemini killer is dead, Jason Miller is swapped out for Brad Dourif and his demeanor becomes even more erratic. The first time I saw this movie, I was so confused by what was going on here. Kinderman doesn't acknowledge the change in appearance, and the whole thing left me feeling really lost. Essentially what this change in casting is doing for the movie is to confirm to the audience that this isn't truly Karis and that the Gemini has taken that face in some way. The actual reason for why this was done has to do with the alternate cut of the movie. Brad Dourif was the first one cast to play Patient X, but when Blatty gave the studio his cut of the movie, they weren't happy with some of the elements of it, and one of those was the casting of this mysterious character. They wanted Jason Miller back for brand recognition, so along with a bunch of other changes, Miller was brought on to do reshoots. Troubles with his health made it very difficult for Miller to deliver on the monologue-heavy role, so Dourif was given a rewritten script on short notice to come back and play the Gemini killer while Jason Miller's role was kept to a minimum for the scenes where Karis peeks through. It, it is a shame that Miller was in poor health, that, that's too bad, but Dourif's performance in this role is a career highlight for an actor that has no shortage of those. He's very good at playing highly intense roles and there are some long-running monologues that go all over the place in intensity, but Dourif doesn't miss a beat. Oh now, there was some confusion when the medics said that Karis was dead. He wanted out, but I was in. There's a lot of weird shit going on with this character. He'll go from yelling at the top of his lungs to quietly talking to himself, and then next second he's singing some angelic vocals or doing weird animal sounds. This villain is one of the most compelling to me because he's locked away in isolation during all the recent murders, and him looking like Karis does raise a lot of questions. The movie takes its time to slowly reveal what's going on at the core of this, but for the sake of the video, I'm, I'm just gonna get into that now. The story behind Patient X is that on the same night Damien died, James Veneman, known more infamously as the Gemini Killer, was put in the electric chair after being found guilty of multiple gruesome murders. When Veneman died, something on the other side saw an opportunity, that something seeming to be the demon that had been expelled from Reagan's body, along with other malevolent beings who decided they'd like to use Veneman. His body was fried by the chair, so what ended up happening was right at the moment that Damien's soul left his body, Veneman was slipped into it, and before the body was buried, he creaked out of the coffin and another man was killed and placed inside of it. And that's who's buried under Damien Karras' gravestone. Veneman, now in Karras' body, was brought into the psych ward 15 years ago. The reason that he was amnesic and non-responsive is because Karras' brain and bone tissue were too badly damaged for Veneman to function with, so over these last 15 years he's been sitting here with the help of those on the other side trying to regenerate the body and brain so that the violence can resume. Karis' body was chosen because of his connection to the exorcism and because using a priest's body seems like the perfect blasphemy for those involved with this scheme, almost like a form of revenge for them being kicked out of their host. The murder started when Veneman was able to regenerate enough of Karis' brain to function, and with the help of his new friends, he would leave the body and possess other people to commit the murders, which is why Miss Clelia's fingerprints were found in the vials of Dyer's blood. It's really hard to make a sequel to a movie like The Exorcist feel like it wasn't made to try and ride the coattails of the original success, and as far as that goes, The Exorcist 3 may be the best example of how to make a sequel to a movie like that. This story just feels like a really natural progression of the first movie in a way that a lot of sequels fail to, which really is a testament to just how good of a writer William Peter Blatty is. Anyway, there's too many incredible moments between these two to talk about all of them, but suffice it to say this is top tier shit. Now if there's one scene that this movie is most known for, it's without a doubt this one. Jump scares are used as a crutch for horror movies all the time, almost to a point where we've been completely desensitized to them. It's usually a cheap way to startle the audience without needing to craft a more effective and impactful scene, but there are a handful of great jump scares in movies. They can be great, they just need to be in the right hands, and apparently, Blatty's got two of them. This is a very slow building scene that takes a long while to first build up a sense of tension by having a strange noise that the nurse is investigating, then relieving that tension with a false jump scare when a patient is startled awake. But there's still a sense of unease when you hear her name and remember what Veneman said in his cell. Good night, Amy. What's your name? I'm going to report you. My name is Amy Keating. The tension then slowly creeps back in, and once the shift change for the police in the back happens, you just know something's about to go down, but it doesn't make it any less scary. Absolutely perfect. 
It's a golden example of how to execute a jump scare properly, and it's the scene this movie is most known for for very good reason. So now we've got another murder, and Dr. Temple was found having committed suicide in his office. The issue with this movie is that I don't think it does a great job at explaining certain elements of the plot that were a lot more clear in the novel. Not that I want it all handed out to me on a silver platter, but just for a bit more detail about things like Temple's death, but Maybe I'm just saying that because in the novel, the scene where Temple does this is really fucking cool, but I won't spoil that here. Anyway, things really come to a head when Veneman possesses another patient from the psychiatric ward and clones Kinderman's voice to call his wife and tell her that a nurse is coming to the house just as Kinderman is actually trying to call home to warn them about being in danger. Thankfully, he arrives in time to put a stop to it, but it's damn close. All right, time to talk about the ending. Now, I, I realized I didn't put a warning for that in the Exorcist 2 review, but don't watch that movie. You should watch this one. Skip to the conclusions chapter if you haven't seen the movie and don't want the ending spoiled for you. The actual spot where I have the most issue with The Exorcist 3 is in its ending. There is a lot that I do like, but it just gets a bit too wild for my taste in an Exorcist sequel, and there's a bit of it that feels too much like a retread. There's a priest that gets brought in to conduct an exorcism on Karis's body, but it feels like he was just added in so that this movie would actually have an exorcism. Remember, this movie was supposed to just be called Legion, but the studio wanted to use the exorcist name for brand recognition. The whole exorcism isn't in Blatty's cut and it's not in the novel, and the actual priest who conducts it is really shallow. Marin feels like a fleshed out but mysterious and experienced man. Well, this guy just feels like a priest puppet for the sake of having an exorcism. That being said, I can't deny that even if it feels too forced and goes too over the top for my taste, there's some pretty cool shit here. Particularly, the priest gets stuck to the ceiling and when he tries to peel himself off, his fucking skin is ripped off. That's so cool. There's a big showdown between Kinderman and Veneman when the detective rushes back to the hospital after saving his daughter and shit's getting all biblical now. Where I really start to enjoy this is when the scene settles down a bit. We get that familiar rattling croaking voice from the first movie and I love this shot of the pillar of light touching the crucifix. Things are looking pretty bad for Kinderman but the priest hasn't been fully killed yet and he uses whatever reserve he has left to give Kinderman a brief moment to do what he needs to do. You want to talk about movies giving goosebumps? I think I've made it pretty clear as I've gone through these movies that Damien Karras is one of my favorite characters in film and this moment hits me hard every time. Bill now! Shoot now! Kill me now! He uses that one moment where he has control as an opportunity to sacrifice himself yet again after being trapped in this evil, disgusting cage and being forced to watch the awful things it did with his hands. Amazing and very heartbreaking. Bill, now free me. With the vessel Veneman and the Legion was using now killed, they're thrown back into whatever hellhole they came from, and Damien Karras is finally laid to rest with a proper burial. Kinderman is left watching this friend he's now had to lose twice go into the ground with Atkins by his side. I hope he'll find another friend to go to the movies with. It's a bleaker ending than the first movie, and while a lot of the climax doesn't do much for me, those last few minutes hit all the right notes. So that's The Exorcist 3. Heretic would lead you to believe that making a sequel to The Exorcist can't work, but in came Legion saying that it absolutely can. I know there are some people out there who say this is the best in the whole franchise, and while I won't go that far, it's easily the best sequel we've gotten. It sets itself apart from the original and told a unique and impactful story that pulls on the heartstrings and has some of the most entertaining dialogue scenes I can think of. It also boasts one of the best jump scares ever pulled off, and the performances all around are incredible. The murder mystery side of the story is handled extremely well and feels genuinely compelling as it slowly unfolds, and the characters are fantastic. Also, the novel is absolutely worth a read, especially if you want a more subdued ending than what we got in this movie. It also has a lot more internal character detail for Kinderman that you don't get in the movie, it's one I definitely recommend you check out. This is a story that you can tell was written by the same man who wrote the original because of how it weaves its thematic material in with the narrative in such a natural way. I don't think it hits the same high notes that the original did, but it's a great movie that you should absolutely give a watch if you haven't before. The Exorcist Believer is out in just a few weeks, and we've only got two more movies, sort of, to look at before we can finally check it out. Until then, thank you for stopping by Rockland Graves. I hope you've enjoyed your stay.